not CEO. I like the CEO title. That's good. We need to call my boss and let him know that I just got promoted. <laughs> good evening. My name is Ian Williams. Uh, glad to be with you tonight. And what a fascinating night to spend some time together and go through a TEDx event. We have uh, a few different topics. I'm going to take you on a very different journey for the next 18 minutes. We're going to talk about the digital self and technology. My background is strictly technology. For whether that's good or bad, you can tell me in 15 to 18 minutes. Uh, but it kind of build on, it builds on what Eric talked about in his presentation. We have a real exciting opportunity in front of us, and you folks in the audience are really going to help us define what this digital self is going to be over time. I'm going to try to interweave that with a little bit of technology, where we are today, where we can go tomorrow. And overall, I want to leave you with some thoughts around how this is going to impact your lives. It impacted my life about three months ago when I met uh, a very smart young man named Dylan who said, we'd love for you to come and join us in this presentation and talk about technology. Great. I love that. What does that represent? It's really easy. Just tell us what the next 100 years will look like. <laughs> no, uh, no small feet, Dylan. So we'll see how we do tonight. There's some different factors that are affecting this. So I'm going to talk about the digital self, help define that, and then we're going to talk about the technology around that. But more importantly, the educational environment, the social environment, the political environment wrapped around this is probably more important than technology. So for the folks in the audience that know Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, famous Moore's Law, been around since 1965. Every 24 months, we can double the number of, of transistors on an integrated chip, which increases performance amazingly in computers. Every time you look at your iPad to think about how thin that thing is, how much technology is packed in there, and what you can do with that device should really boggle your mind. Moore's law has been consistent since 1965, and having worked at uh, technology companies all my life, it will continue to be a factor. The impact on you is technology is not slowing down. Technology go faster and faster. Product revs, based on Eric's uh, midgets, the powerful midgets that are going to come and bring that HTML code to life, they're going to open up new opportunities we didn't see coming. And they're going to bring it on an 18-month or a 12-month product life cycle. So every 12 months, get your wallet out and buy some new technology. More importantly, and Dylan made a joke about the NSA and the, and the PRISM technology, the one question you have to walk away with this presentation is, sure we can, but should we? Right? We have the technology to do a whole lot of stuff. Some good, some bad. I think if you ask the, uh, the prime ministers and presidents around the world right now, they're asking them that question. Sure you can, but should you? Listen to my call when I'm the, uh, the leader of Germany, for example. So, a little bit of a challenge there. That is based on educational, social, political parameters that you are all going to help define. I want to walk you through a little bit about me first, though, because if I'm taking 18 minutes of your time, you at least get the courtesy of understanding why I'm up here. Uh, born and raised in, uh, in Canada, so the only reason I tell you that is because you're going to get a lot of out and abouts, and so I don't want to hear later, where's that guy from? So that's where I was born and raised. 1999, I transferred with Compaq Computer Corporation into Houston, Texas. That's a heck of a culture shock for a Canadian. <laughs> Walking from ski and hockey country into a barbecue and lots of fun with y'alls and y'alls. So uh, good thing about Houston, a lot of good things, but it also brought us our, our son, who's now 11. Uh, our next move is to Raleigh, North Carolina. My daughter was born there. She's now nine. And subsequently, seven years in Lakeville. Love Lakeville, love the community, love being a part of the community. So much so that we became Americans, my wife and I, a couple of years ago. So glad to be part of it. Thank you very much. Yes, we love America. It's great. Why that matters is because we can't choose a hockey team. That's the bigger impact. We're all hockey fanatics. Canadians fit in well in Minnesota, but we can't figure out if it's blue or red, which drives our politics as well. So moving on. Into our technology mantra. As I said, when I came out of college for the, the high school students in the room, I faced an, an economy very similar, maybe not as as unique as the one now, but we came out of, out of university and high school at that time with no jobs. NAFTA was, was front and center, North American Free Trade Agreement. That was all a rage. No one knew what it meant. No one knew if it was going to mean jobs were gone. Uh, subsequently, all those manufacturing jobs we worried about going to Mexico ended up going to the Seven Tigers in Asia anyways. But at the time, it drove hiring decisions for companies. So as Eric talked about how he took his journey from engineering into the education field, I took my marketing degree into technology. I found I had a passion for technology. I loved it. I loved what it could do. But in those days, technology was a Commodore 64. Not very impressive. 
We've come a long way into the iPad world and the uh, iDevice world. So I've had a, a great ride technology-wise with these companies. The only reason I tell you this, I've just given you the digital self of Ian Williams. All this information is on Facebook, LinkedIn. It's pervasive on the internet. So it's out there now. It may not mean anything to do as you walk out of here in 15 minutes. But what it drives me to do is it really meant to me I have a passion around data. Everything we generate, everything we create, everything we store, protect, and how we connect drives our data footprint in the world. And that's the genesis of the digital self. That's who we are. We're taking our, ourselves today, transferring it into a new technology. And this is what we're left with. Overload. We're a petabyte away from becoming another A&E reality show called Hoarders. We're digital hoarders. We've got to save everything. We save every file. We save every um, MP3 file. We, we save everything we can because, God forbid, I know I'm going to need it down the road. As a matter of fact, I better copy it. I better put it in the cloud as well. So now I've created three footprints of myself, and you're all doing the same thing. So storage companies love that, so please keep doing that. And here's where we are today. We're in the app world. We're in the device world. So when I started thinking about this topic with Dylan, where are we in this digital reality, the digital self, and how technology is getting us there, we're based on applications 101. We're in the prologue of this chapter. And then I realized that whole analogy breaks down because I'm talking about writing a book in a digital environment. Not a very smart, uh, smart analogy. We've got Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all the conversations happening and being transformed in the digital world. And we're, we're absolutely wrapped up in how we share that information on devices. We haven't even started to understand what the digital world can be for us going forward, what the digital self will represent going into the next generation. We're still trying to track how we use this technology whether it's maps, whether it's about sharing how great our life is. Has anybody else thought of another name for Facebook? Perhaps like the greatest place in the world where no one ever has a bad day book? You never ever read anything horrible on Facebook. It's, oh my God, I just got, I arrived in Tokyo today. It's beautiful. Well, lucky you. That's great. So you got to think through how these technologies are being used. We transport ourselves into this wonderful world of digital reality. And for all the technology we have, we spend more time playing Candy Crush and doing Snapchat than anything really productive. But this whole boon has created another economy, completely new economy. It's a very exciting time for you folks as you're getting ready to run into high school. You guys are at the very, very first chapter of writing the digital self. You're going to help write what the digital self is. I was hoping the twi tweet wall was going to be up the Twitter wall. Is it uh, absolutely kaput? I think we're afraid of Taco Bell plugs again. That was great. Taco Bell's going to love that. I was going to do a, a chat here and see how we're doing, but let's jump into digital natives really quick. This blows my mind for a lot of reasons. So we talked about Dylan and, and your generation being called millennials. Sorry, it's not Gen X, it's something else. The reality is you guys handle information differently. We're going to hear from Maggie in a, in a little bit, a wonderful young lady who's going to do a great presentation on technology as well. And I think about what she's born and raised into in this environment. She's never known the world as I've known it. She's never known the technology the way I've known it. She's never had a Commodore 64. She's really at a, at a very important part of technology. And as she grows up, that technology is going to change again as well. And the most fascinating for me is two things. Number one is this generation didn't grow up with a TV. They grew up with four devices in the living room. Because <laughs> I want to do as many things as possible while watching TV. I want to chat with my friends. I want to do some things on my iPad. I've got four screens in that living room today. My attention span and my connection, my human connection, may not be as good as it should be in real time, but in digital time, it's doing pretty good with four screens. The other thing is this audience, this generation, is going to grow up with some very explosive, divisive political commentary. You're seeing it firsthand, have for the last 10 years. We got our news in 30-second snaps. We got a very politicized, left or right wing perspective. Internationally, there's a little more moderate approach to it, right? So they look at us and kind of wonder, why well, are they getting the full story? I challenge you as you think about the digital self to ask, you that, ask that question again. Sure we could, or sorry, can we, I know we can, but should we? I know we can, but should we? So digital hoarders, we're gonna move right past that because we've had to digitize everything and no one's really talked about the economics of it. I'm not gonna bore you to tears. But leave it to say that companies today can't afford to keep putting your YouTube videos up online. They can't put two or three copies of your YouTube videos up online. 
As a matter of fact, Google, and, and this is public knowledge, they're consuming 500, 600, 700,000 hard drives per quarter and racking them in massive factories and having PhDs on roller skates run around and service those devices. Their facilities are massive, so much so that it's not the storage that's the problem, that's an issue. The real issue is power and cooling. How do I afford to put the lights on? How do I afford to run those air conditioners to keep those units cool? So much so they've actually taken their facilities and put them over by power, power dams. They've moved it to a different facility where they can get low cost energy. So it's pretty fascinating in terms of the challenges, again, your generation is going to face. The term big data gets thrown around a lot. The bottom line here is Netflix, for example. Netflix, we stream our information, very cool, great way. I don't have to go stand by the red box that's always busy at Walgreens and lined up with 14 cars in front of me, and I always get the, the movie I didn't want anyways. What Netflix is doing with that data, if you stream it, is they're pulling off all the analytics around it. They want to understand who you are, what you're doing, what time you're watching that. Any demographic information they can pull off of because that helps them tweak their business model and can in fact market to you more effectively. We're facing a data deluge and it's affecting every part of our life. It's a fascinating time. And this is how we measure success. How many friends do I have? We can't be that far with all this technology and this is how we measure success. So, going forward. I want, to, I want to do a quick snapshot on technology because this is really important to understand how we got here. First email, 1971, we can debate that, pre being government education before that, but the first commercialization of, of email. I was born in 1970, so I guess I'm older than email. Very cool. Floppy technology. We actually still sell floppy disks, believe it or not, today. People in Taiwan and other geographies still use it for different, uh, different things in terms of sharing data, but not a lot of five and a quarter inch floppy technology. Maggie's not going to see that. The first Mac came out. You know, we get into the whole Mac world, and then you see the first iPod coming out based on our hard drive. The only problem with that thing is if you shook it, the head hit the platter and your music's gone. We've gone to you know, solid state technology in 2007. So in that short timeline, without going back through the history of technology, We've had some radical change. Maggie's always been able to carry her music in her pocket and not have to worry about milk crates full of records. It's a very fascinating time. And more importantly, she's going to miss the Walkman. Love the Walkman. Not that long ago, folks. Does anybody remember this? Yell it out if you know what it was. Oh, Android. Oh, my gosh. No, close. Newton. It was the Apple Newton. So this is, this is something where if you gave me $500, I'll give you a learning technology. It will learn. Just stick with it. It never learned. But this is the predecessor to what we have today in terms of our iPhones. I still have two in my basement. They're fascinating. And most importantly, she'll never know that Will Smith was actually the Fresh Prince. So I'm sorry that uh, you're going to miss that. Jumping forward. Three different radical concepts now the digital self. And I'm going to talk a little faster because I have about 84 more slides to go. In the digital world, how this evolves really quickly is I want to kind of stop where we are today and jump to where we can go. This is today's technology, drone technology. Right? So today we have unmanned remote control capability. We dispatch this for military, surveillance, border patrol. It's actually a, becoming a very common uh, technology. It just took $11, $12 billion as a program to drive it and then subsequently about 16, 17 million dollars for predator drone. So it takes a lot of money to get in here. Now, compared to the other options, it's very affordable. My point here is government education technology are linked because if we didn't have that 11 or 12 billion dollar investment initially, this technology would be years away. The core technology, I wanted to call this out because this is here today. Advanced optics, we have to be able to see what's on the ground, pull it back, transport it by a satellite, to a user base in Vegas. In Las Vegas, we've got a, a facility there. So satellite data transmission is a given. And we have our data being analyzed and processed centrally. Right? All that information gets pulled into one data center, maybe replicated for protection, but at the end of the day, it's the way we compute. Let's jump forward 25 years. And again, this is me doing my best to be a technologist, so forgive me if it's way off in 25 years. For lack of a better word, man technology. I was going to try person technology, but it didn't really work. So I'm sticking with man technology. This is available today. This is a Raytheon technology called the, it's a exoskeleton XOS2 program. And the idea is to help soldiers with physical tasks and to avoid fatigue in the battlefield. It's a very cool use of robotics and technology. One of the first generations tied to an individual user. And it tries to augment capability, not so much intelligence, but more so about capability. 
Now, if we take and build that in terms of where that can go, let's keep going. So we have those same capabilities. Let's just check the box that's going to be there. I want simultaneous data. I want to be able to see that stuff into my unit. Human, machine, merged. Usage, military, police rescue, same. The core technology, optics, satellite, centralized processing and data transmission. I need to be able to get that information. It's probably going to something like this, right? If you think about it where it could go, we can debate the color scheme, but it could be something like this. Human at the center of the equation wrapped around some pretty cool technology. Three other elements on this, of course, are jet propulsion. Today, we actually have capability with certain gases to be able to move certain distances, not really used because it's highly dangerous, very volatile. Um, arc reactor, good luck. Um, but in theory, today, that previous device actually has a power pack that moves with it. Power is going to be a very exciting opportunity going forward because we all need it. Nothing better than running around MSP airport and seeing everybody looking for a cord. That's the way it's going to work going forward. Next 50 to 100 years, a little more out there, folks, so bear with me. Some of the same technology, data, you know, satellite data transmission, there's probably going to be another generation of that. Robotics have come into multiple generations by now, very, very common. The last point is the important one, autonomous, advanced AI. How does that look? Maybe something like this. There today, we've seen it in the commercials, Honda's worked on it, programmable, very cool. With life imitating art, maybe it's something like this. Don't know. The capability is there. These technologies, if you actually Google them, there's an awful lot of research papers available on where this technology can go and that it's not that science fiction anymore. So I know I'm talking quickly. I get passionate about this. I apologize. Um, hopefully I haven't used a lot of out and abouts. But you can see how education, technology, and politics are coming together. And there's going to be some impact. There's nothing funnier than watching people in their cars and how we think we're all not being looked at, we're not in a glass house, how we act, how we drive, how we really kind of treat each other on the road. Anonymity is not an excuse in the digital world. At the end of the day, you are accountable for your actions, right? You can't sit back and just try to hide. These three realities are merging. Personal, professional, and private are smashing together. So the encouraging thing here for you kids is when you're going to university, make sure you're careful with what you put up on that web. Grandma's going to see it, but so is your potential employer. You have to be accountable, it's going to be impactful, and data doesn't just disappear. Unless you're putting a drill bit through that hard drive, it's still there. There's still data on that drive. We see the political realities every day today. We see how this is getting... I love this cartoon, this is great. Sorry. Big Bill Clinton fan. So... And I didn't... I really could have spent about an hour or so talking about privacy. We are so enamored by technology today, we will simply check that box, accept that privacy letter that's 14 pages long, six-point font, because I want that free app. That's very, very dangerous. That is all our data up there, unsecured. It'll be used. It's in that mouse type that no one's reading. And my last slide before I wrap up. You have to be careful before you put a white or a black hat on these people. Okay? This is, this is where it gets a little heavy. I'm sorry. But you have to think through privacy. You have to think for impact. We're reacting to what's going on today. We can debate hero or evil, but at the end of the day, history is going to be the judge of these people in terms of NSA prism, in terms of international leaders responding to how data is being used and how that digital self is being perceived. So I'm 36 seconds over time. My apologies. My last two things as I start off. Please help us. You are going to be defining what the digital world and the digital self will look like going forward. Be smart about it. Understand accountability. And make sure you think through some of these things. Ask that question. Can, but should we? Sure we can. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.